So, this morning, we're looking at, I'm going to give you an overview of the existing buildings code. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit of a history of the different codes that were used for existing buildings and how we got to where we're at now and how this code operates. What's your options within that code? I'm not going to address any specific code within that code. In other words, no code sections because I didn't want to get too detailed. Honestly, this code is going to be over most everybody's head in terms of knowledge unless you are a designer or uh, an inspector. It's just that way. That's the way codes are, unfortunately, for, for most everybody. So, let's see what we got. Uh, the 26, this is the history of the development of the timeline. We used to have uh, a 1995 code that <laughs> some remember. I remember seeing it. I never implemented it. Um, Chapter 34 in the 2012 code was a, a way to get to um, existing buildings, how to evaluate them, uh, to see what you could and couldn't do. You didn't have to bring an existing building up to all the current code, but it would let you evaluate for that. And then you had uh, the rehabilitation code. It also came in in 2012. And as uh, Tim alluded to, it was a New Jersey code. And it would let you do a lot of things that may not have been, for lack of a better word, safe. That code was New Jersey law, and it meshed with what they did in terms of fire requirements. And we didn't adopt the fire requirements, we adopted this part of it, the rehabilitation code back in 2012. So. Things that were done back then may not be the safest of buildings because of that. Because we didn't get the whole picture, we just got part of the picture. Realizing that, ICC finally developed, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using acronyms, the International Code Council, who writes the base of all of our North Carolina codes, wrote an existing building code. The first edition we did not adopt because it's like buying the first release of an automobile. You never do that. It's going to have glitches in it. So we waited till another edition and then we adopted it in 2015, which was in the 20, actually it was the 2015 I code at that time. So we were up to date with the code. And we adopted it and in that committee they rolled a lot of the allowances of the rehabilitation code into that code to make it more cost effective to use that code is the best way to put that. So now we have the, uh, the 2015 code. It came into effect in, what does it say, March? March 1 of 2015. Now we're in the 18 edition and it went into effect January 1 of this year. There are three compliance methods that this code offers. This is a little different than the rehab code. Rehab code was so, convoluted, they made a spreadsheet so you could figure out how to navigate that code. It's still on our website, I think. They started one for this code, but this code doesn't really need it. You got three compliance methods. Uh, you got a prescriptive method, which is going to be a lot like just meeting what the current code would require for a new building. Um, you got a work area method, and I'm going to just explain all these things to you. And then you have a performance method. The performance method is going to be where you evaluate the building. And you're going to be able to do trade-offs, and I'll explain that a little bit more. So these are the way the chapters are broken down. Uh, one through two, administrative. It's the same almost in every code. It tells you the scope of the code, what it's going to include, and how to operate. Uh, then you got your compliance methods in chapter three. It's going to be an explanation, and you you can read what's there. <coughs> One of the biggest things that never gets mentioned much in presentations is that last line item. It's called resource A. For you building owners, this is an important resource, and what it is is archaic building assemblies for fire resistance rating because a lot of the issues you have with existing buildings is fire resistance rating 
And what's the other big thing everybody has, usually has to have on things that they don't want to pay for? Sprinklers. Sprinklers. So those are the two things. But this, are, this uh, resource A is all about uh, how this assembly here may have been uh, a rated assembly in, it may have been 80 years ago. But it's going to cover all those assemblies. And you're, you can use those assemblies when you're determining your ratings if you have to have separation between you, say, your first and second floor for something like a, a residence. Okay, you got your scope of work. You, got, you can either have repair, alterations, there's three levels of alterations, uh, change of occupancy, additions, and then you have historic buildings, move buildings, how to address those. You got different chapters that will help you figure out what you need to do to accomplish these things. <coughs> repair is pretty simple. Uh, what it basically says is if you've got, if you have, that's right, I'm from around here and I use got instead of have. Um, if you have a, a, a rotten roof assembly, two by four, uh, two by six, two by ten joists are bad. Code will let you go back and replace that joist with the exact same joist. Um, if your roof um, structure is bad, it lets you go back and repair it with the same roof structure. It's that kind of thing. This came up quite frequently at the coast recently with the hurricanes. A lot of buildings had part of their roof taken off. And instead of having the requirement to go back and uh, reestablish those roofs with the current energy code requirements, they could go back and reestablish that roof just like it was before. Nothing less, but just like it was before. Repair is basically that. You can repair things with like materials, like assemblies. Oh, back up. Alterations, you're going to have three levels. You have alterations one, two, and three based on how much work's being done, how much is being altered in the building. Uh, simple alterations such as um, we're going to take down all this wood paneling, wainscoting, and we're going to put up tile. That's an alteration level one. You're not changing how the space is configured. You're not changing your egress path. You're not changing the structure. You're basically changing out finishes. Level two is where you're not altering an entire floor or an entire building. You're altering half a floor, a smaller portion. So if you're altering a smaller portion, you, got, you have less requirements on the building. And level three, obviously, if you're doing more than 50%, doing a whole building type of thing, then all these things kick in an alteration level three. In, alter in any of these, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to come to current code on what you're doing. In most cases, if you're doing something new, however, it's going to send you to the current code for that requirement. Let's say you're, uh, <coughs> you've got an open space, and now you're going to break it up into offices uh, with a corridor. If the current code requires that car to be one hour rated, the existing building code is going to require that as well. If you have an existing corridor, it's not going to require you to bring that existing corridor up. So it's trying to you know, give you some breaks on what you have existing in the buildings, what it's about. Uh, change of occupancy has two points to it. One, if you do a change of occupancy and an alteration, then chapter 14, is it 14? No. Chapter 10, change of occupancy, and the alteration chapters may come into play both together. But change of occupancy, it's got, it has an assessment in there where you can decide you're changing from this occupancy classification. How many knows what occupancy classification is when I say that? Okay. <coughs> Buildings are classified to occupancy based on how they're used. Different uses require a different amount of safety. For instance, this space holds not more than 50. So it's considered a Group B occupancy, a business occupancy, which is different than, say, the business that you see on zoning or other things, your license, for instance. It's a B out of the building code. It's an entirely different thing. If you had more than 50, it would be considered an assembly space. In assembly space, you have a lot more safety requirements because you have a large number of people in a concentrated area with the potential for panic. 
So that's when you see things like Panic Hardware, hence the name. And then you have sprinkler requirements when you get to a certain number so that you buy more time for the people to get out because they're going to be unorganized leaving. Things like that door swing in the direction of egress so people don't stack up against the door and die there. That type of thing. Uh, you have educational occupancy. You don't care about these. BAS, storage, is an occupancy classification. Under there you have different classifications of storage, some hazardous, some less hazardous. So the code delineates between those two, has different requirements for it. Same thing with assemblies. You have different requirements for your typical assembly like this as opposed to a restaurant where you have unorganized aisles. Uh, food and drink are served in A2, uh, assembly occupancy two classifications. And you have different requirements there if it's a nightclub. And the nightclub requirements come from obviously from the nightclub fire that we had not too long ago uh, north of here. So you have different requirements based on how it's used. So you have to classify a building to its occupancy. If you don't know how to do that, typically I recommend hiring a designer to help you with it. So you got chapter one, you got your delineation, the intent, the applicability of this code. Right. Uh, mixed use buildings uh, is one of the things to know about. Not all buildings are all group B, not all group A. You may have A and B in the same building like this building could have been if this thing held more than 50. It doesn't hold more than 50 in here, does it? <coughs> Quick count, one, two, three, four, five, six. It does. It does hold more than 50. Okay, so this is assembly. Okay, so you got group A in here, A3. Across the hall is group B, business. The, the offices are here where they take your uh, uh, water payment, water bill payment, that's B, and so forth. So you can have multiple. You could have had a restaurant in here. Strip shopping centers are, you know, they obviously have multiple. Group M, B, A, all kinds of things. Same thing in all the building codes. All the building codes now have all the definitions in Chapter 2. And the existing building code is no different. It's going to have the definitions. There are terms that are used in the codes that are specific to the codes. They may have a different definition if you were looking to Webster's, but in this code, this is how that word, this is what that word means. And when you read through the codes, there'll be, a, that, there'll be words that are italicized. That italicized word means that it's defined back in chapter two, okay? So you have, sometimes you have to look to see what that term means. It may not mean what you're accustomed to it saying, all right? For instance, existing buildings, just to be plain, you just think of an existing building as a building that's already built, right? But it's not. It's a building that is legally occupied and legally occupied prior to the current vacant. If a, vac if a building's been vacant for, uh, the code doesn't care if it's been vacant for 100 years. Whatever that occupancy was before, and that building was legally occupied, it's an existing building. Now you may have deficiencies when you come back to it if it's been vacant for 100 years. You're probably going to have repair work that has, has to be done. <laughs> but that's, and then legally occupied is, de is defined because it's used up here and le legally occupied may have a different uh, meaning if you went somewhere like the general statutes. So there's your, your occupancy classifications there I was talking about. That's all of them right there. And then you see you got A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Those are occupancy classifications. Then group A in a whole is called an occupancy group. And then you have occupancy use. And those terms are all defined here because they're used specifically in sections of the existing building code. So you got four, your prescriptive compliance, work area compliance, performance. So five through 13 is your work area compliance requirements, <coughs> which includes chapter 10, your change of occupancy. Uh, so there used to be a chapter 34 in the building code and ICC took that out and moved it into the existing building code. So that's what we did. 34 is, doesn't exist in our 
building code, which is the big blue book laying over here, it now it resides in chapter 14 of the existing building code. It's the same, they made modifications to it uh, from information that they've accumulated over those, that time period, but it's basically the same requirements. A two-story brick and heavy timber building built in the 20s located in downtown district. Well, that sounds familiar, except most of our buildings are not heavy timber. Heavy timber building, the only one we had in near downtown was the old White's Furniture Building. It used to be type four. Type four construction is where you got you have masonry exterior walls and you have the heavy large members for columns, beams, floor joists, and you have one and a half inch thick tongue and groove floor. In other words, old factories is what type four was intended for. You didn't have any concealed spaces in type four. And when I say concealed, nothing hidden from view. Everything was exposed in Type 4 construction. And that was so that uh, if you had a fire, that fire could not spread without knowledge of it being spread. So firefighting was simplified because you see it moving. Uh, the other thing about Type 4 is you have all that heavy wood. What's the advantage of heavy wood? It's really thick. Wood has a char rate. In other words, when it catches fire, it may not just burn the piece up, it'll burn the surface first. It's going to burn the fiber at the surface first. When it, char and it, when it burns, it leaves behind a char, <coughs> charcoal. So wood burns at, it's been figured out, burns at one and a half inches per hour. So you'll have a charring of one and a half inches in an hour on a piece of wood. So if you have heavy timber, which is going to be required to be four and six inch thickness, you, that wood will be there a long time before it fails. However, after it's been charred, then you're kind of in trouble the next time it, it catches fire. <coughs> so that's what heavy timber basically is. So you got a heavy timber building, 20s. Uh, you want to convert into two apartment units. So what thing you need to know first is you have the lawyer's office, which was a business occupancy. You're going to change it to two apartments, and you need, we would have to know what the occupancy classification for those apartments are. Two apartments, not three, but two. Two apartments are group R3, residential R3, because there's only two in the building. If there's only one in the building, that's group R3. So you can have one to two apartments or residential dwelling units in a building. They're considered R3. When you go to three, it becomes a different classification. It becomes an R2. And the reason it becomes a different classification is because now you've put more people at risk. You have more sleeping people in the building. So you have different requirements for safety. So they've changed it to R3. <clears throat> so now our sprinklers required on the second floor, <clears throat> where, those, where that R3 is. Well, we'd have to go to the building code and look at a chart in chapter 10. It's going to say, is R3 more um, hazardous than the B occupancy was? And if you go to that chart, it's going to tell you that they're the same. <clears throat> so our sprinklers are required on the second floor if he does any work up there to modify that space into an apartment from being the business occupancy, then he's going to fall into the alterations in chapter 8, alteration level 2 actually, or actually be 3, but let's say it falls back to 2 <clears throat> in, chapter, in that chapter, chapter 8. It's going to require that space to be sprinklered because now you're altering the space. So you're doing work in the space. The code assumes if you're doing work in that space and you can expend that money to convert that space, then you're going to have the resources to put in that sprinkler system that the code would require if you were building this building new. All right. Also, what comes into play is that that space is not occupied now because you're doing this level of alteration. So 
there's nobody in there that you're going to be disturbing to put in that sprinkler system. So in that case, yeah, you'd have to put the sprinklers in. All right, separation required. Yes, always with group R, separation is required. Change of occupancy, alteration, the only time it's not going to be required is repair. And that separation is required, well, any guesses why the separation is required between residential occupancy and the rest of the building? That's a good guess. It's there because people are sleeping. People are sleeping have to have extra time to wake up. Well, first, it takes a little bit to notify them that something's going to have to go off, like a smoke detector, to alert them that they're there's something going on. They're going to have to wake up, they're going to have to orient, and then they're going to have to make decisions. Is it really smoke in the building or is my battery low? Things like that. So you have separation requirements so if you have a fire in another area, you have that additional time provided by that separation to get you out of the building before that fire extends into your, into your dwelling unit. Uh, emergency escape and rescue openings. How many of you know what emergency escape and rescue openings are? It's a, it's a certain size window or door that you can use to get out of your house. Actually, it's four bedrooms to get out of the bedroom. And it also provides an opening for the fire service to get into the building to get you out if you're not able to get out on your own. So you got a certain height off the floor so that everybody has a chance they can get to that height and get out the window. It's also a certain size so that uh, those of us who enjoy barbecue have a big enough window to get out of. It also gives the fire service a, a large enough open, opening to get into the building with their oxygen tanks and equipment on. So, are emergency rescue openings required for these dwelling units? And that's going to be because there's only one exit on the second floor, then yes. And other items will be addressed. The alterations are going to have to comply with the building code. All right, that's your prescriptive method. Now, work area compliance comes into repairs, alterations, change of occupancy, additions, historic buildings, move buildings. All those things fall into that. Uh, have that classification of work, and they're all listed in Chapter Five. Tells you exactly what those things are. So if you want to know what type of work that you're planning, you figure out what you want to do to the building, you can go to Chapter 5 and figure out if I'm going to use this method, this work area compliance method, you can go to Chapter 5 and figure out what type of work you're doing, so then you know which chapters beyond that to apply to what work you're doing. <coughs> Patching, restoration, replacement, uh, those types of things. So you maintain that level of protection that was existing. So you can always repair a building to its state before uh, the damage. Uh, and you have level one, replacement of coverings, existing materials, uh, can't re cannot reconfigure the space. Uh, in other words, uh, you're not changing uh, the egress of the building. That's what you're not doing. Uh, can I ask a quick question, Paul? You can, you can ask too. Uh, under repair, if it's not, if the roof's not damaged but it's aged, and you want to replace it, is that a repair and use the same material or? It it is a repair. Re-roofing it would be a repair. Even if it involved replacing the, the structural components. Yes. Mm -hmm. All I, that's repair. Can I follow up on that? Um, so yeah, two two questions. <laughs> With repairs, is at any point is there a, a cost that throws it out of that category? Good question. Is there a cost that throws it out of the category of repair? <clears throat> there is, generally the codes do not deal with costs, uh, and I do not deal with costs, but there are some things in this code that have to do with more than 50% of the structure being damaged. Is going to apply some additional things. Of the entire structure? Of the entire structure. Not of the roof or of an element, but of the building. 
you get to more than 50% of the damage of a building structurally, it becomes substantial. It's called substantial damage. All right. For me, if a house, if my house lost its roof, to me that's substantial, but <laughs> to the code it's not. So alteration level one, there were some new sections, energy conservation. Energy conservation has become a big item with the codes. There's a lot of people lobbying in both directions on energy conservation. <clears throat> I like energy conservation when I'm paying my power and gas bill. I don't like it so much when I'm doing construction. It's either you pay it up front or you pay it in the long run. It's one, going to be one of the two. There's been some legislation issued lately that affects energy conservation. Uh, I was looking at some of them last night. But one of them in particular, um, Group S storage, is not going to require energy conservation. Group F1 does not require energy conservation. They are exempt. F1 is factory industrial, by the way. S1 is storage or S, S1 and S2, F1 and F2, either one, factory, industrial, or storage. Uh, they've started exempting from the energy conservation. Level two, uh, space reconfiguration up to including 50% including of the area of the building. So the way I read this, building area is a term out of the building code. Designers and the inspectors know what that is. Most of you guys are not the designers, so that's why I keep looking this way. I'm sorry. But in this case, building area means something entirely different. Building area in the code generally means the footprint of the building enclosed by walls is generally what building area is. But in this case, building area is the area of all the floors. So if you have a two-story building, each floor is considered as a uh, aggregate of the area. So if you're doing one of two floors, you're still in a level one alter, a uh, level two alteration. All right, so that's kind of a, a quick explanation. Uh, it's still gonna require, and this is basic with this code, if you do new elements and components and spaces, they have to conform to the current code. If you're constructing a new space, the code assumes that it doesn't warrant any exception to meeting what's required for the new code, from the current code, for new construction. Because you're doing it now. If somebody was building that building new, they'd have to provide that expense. So if you're doing an existing building and you're doing those elements, you're going to have to provide that same expense. Mixed use requires one hour separation between R and non-residential occupancy. Uh, from the non-residential side. So obviously that's usually ratings. If you one hour rate something, one hour fire protect something, that rating is based on <coughs> the amount of time it takes when you apply fire to or heat to one surface to get the opposite surface to a temperature that will ignite cotton. And that's how fire rating is, is issued. It's not when the structure collapses like most people think. It's that rise in temperature to set something, set cotton on fire on the opposite side. So in this particular case, it's not a, a one hour rating as we think of it. In this case, they're looking for that one hour rating on the bottom surface of that ceiling below that residential unit because you're trying to protect that residential unit from that fire in that space below. Okay, so it's a little bit different. <coughs> So if you have a business below and you're going to put an apartment above, <coughs> the business doesn't have the one-hour rating. Right. Where is that located? I mean, you have a ceiling already. Can it be above, does it have to be below the ceiling or can it be above the ceiling? It can be above a lay-in ceiling, but it needs to be below the joists, the floor joists above, because you're trying to protect that, that unit above. So it can be somewhere in that area. Uh, it could be the ceiling, but it's usually it's right at the bottom of that, those uh, floor joists. <coughs> the reason it's on, usually on the bottom of those joists is because if you drop it down, then you've got to rate everything up the sides too, from the ceiling up to the floor joists. Because you've got to have a complete one hour rating. So the walls would have to be too? Yes. It, well, they, 
typically downtown the, the walls are brick, so it becomes a moot issue because they have they can already carry the rating. But if it's if it's wood, then yeah, the, that wood uh, system, the studs would have to have the gypsum up the sides to protect all the way up to the joist. Well, you have where well, you have a, you have a brick wall, and they've gone in and put in studs to make a wall. <coughs> the wall has to be treated on the outside of the studs. Yes, because you have a fire. If you don't do that, you get a fire in the in below. It hits that stud cavity, and it just runs up. Even if it's stopped. If it's fire, uh, now if it's fire stopped, uh, not fire stopped, draft stopped, fire stopped. If it's fire stopped, then no. If you fire stop it, you're good. Now you you probably don't know what I'm talking about when I say fire stopping, but you'd have to go to the building code to find out what is allowed for fire stopping. The simplest thing is put it up there below the joist. Everything gets cut off right there. You don't have that fire potential. Now. I say that because when you get into those ceilings, you're usually going to have electrical work running above that ceiling. The electrical work has got to be separated from that unit above too. The electrical work is usually going to be the cause of the fire. So if you've got that electrical work above that lay-in ceiling or above that drop ceiling, that one hour rating has to be above that. Above the wire? Yes. So you would have to rewire the building? Or put the ceiling up against the joist. Do the old thin ceilings have any fire reading? No. So basically, you have to take them down. You do. And somebody told me how they do that. Because I always thought, well, that's going to be messy. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I believe it was David Maurer was telling me this, that they grind the heads and drive the nail through. And so you don't have the tearing the metal up, pulling it back down. So you can't place a <coughs> separation over an existing <coughs> a ceiling and ceiling? You don't have to add two layers of sheetrock to an existing ceiling and make it If you have an existing ceiling and you want to do that, then yeah, you can put that gypsum below it. The trick is that you don't have exposure to that unit above from systems from the unit below or whatever's below, the occupancy below. But after you've installed that below the joist, you can reinstall the tent or decorative ceiling. Absolutely, and that's what's usually done. They usually grind those heads, take that, that metal ceiling down, uh, put the gypsum up, and then they put that very same metal back up. And for the fire rating to have an hour rating, you also can't have an open stairway, is that right? I mean, if you have right, an you open stairway from one level to the other, that would negate the whole thing. Right, if you had an open stair from level one to level two, that negates your rating because now you just got another place for the fire to pass through. So it's got to be, uh, separation is total separation. <coughs> there are places in the code that will let you have open stair, but in this particular case, you'd have, you could have the open stair, so to speak, uh, the bottom stair, you may not have a door or anything on the stair at the bottom, but when you get to the top, you've got to have one hour rating between that stair and that, that uh, unit. So in a low rise, uh, if you increase your fire area or calculated load beyond 903, 903 is the section of the building code that has to do with sprinklers, when sprinklers are required. That's in the blue book. <coughs> Usually it's based on how much area is going to be affected by a fire or could be affected by a fire without any rated fire separation or it's affected by how many people are in that space. Those two things drive sprinklers. Can you define a low rise building? Low rise. Uh, less than 75 feet above <coughs> uh, fire department access. Has a floor less, all the floors are less than 75 feet below. Uh, high rise, that's a good question. High rise is defined in the building code in chapter two. So if you need to know, all the codes are online, free to look at. You can't print them, you can't copy them, but you can look at them online for free. And I'll get to that at the end of the thing. But if you go to the building code, which is the commercial building code, in chapter two, it'll define high rise buildings for you. None of downtown is high rise, yet. <laughs> uh, Group H is hazardous occupancy. We don't have any of that downtown. You wouldn't have it in the primary fire district anyway. Uh, you got fire protection requirements, uh, alarms is 
additional fire protection requirements. You have alarms and you have sprinkler systems. Let's, let's go through this kind of quick. Means of egress is another part of this. Uh, it's an important part of every building. How do you get out of the building? There's two things that this guy I work with that says when he does plan review, here's the two things he's really looking for. Will the building stand up and can you get out of it? First, he's looking to make sure it'll stand up. He says, there's no need to be able to get out of a building that won't stand up. <laughs> you are not going to make it. So those are, those are his two primary concerns. <clears throat> accessibility. Here's the real kicker about accessibility. You can go to Cliff or Keith, uh, Richard or me, and we'll say, right here in the code it says, you don't have to do that. But I can tell you right now, as the Department of Justice says, you have to do it. You will do it or you will pay, I think it's a $10,000 fine. So, mm, and then you still have to do it. Okay, level three, more than 50%. So this is your big renovation projects. A lot of downtown, you guys uh, are going to fall into level one, I'm sorry, level two or level three in most everything that I've that I've been, that I've known about. So, always new elements, new spaces conform to the building code. A lot of chapter nine is going to send you back. When you get to chapter nine, level three alterations, it basically is going to say you can do what's in this chapter plus everything that's mentioned in eight and seven. So everything goes backwards. And chapter eight is going to say you do everything in chapter eight plus what's in chapter seven. So it's, it's cumulative as you go through those chapter seven, eight, and nine. <clears throat> okay, and we got this building again, 50% 50 of the total building area, each floor is da-da-da, you got that. Uh, first floor is used for a gift shop and the second for a lawyer's office, so the materials used. So you got new materials, you use new code for those new materials. Means of egress, new elements, have to comply with the current code. And existing elements comply with 805. So you get a break. So not everything complies, just the existing ones do not. So you get that 20% and then any new work. Uh, if your new work is, say, putting in an elevator, uh, then you got to do the cost of the elevator plus 20%. You're going to bring something else up to grade. You can't just say that elevator is my 20%. Okay, if the entire project's an elevator, it's an elevator plus 20%. You haven't increased anything, you haven't increased your hazard, and increased your danger, the building gets to stay the same in terms of sprinkler requirements. And then you still got in that new work, flood elevation. We won't be dealing with flood elevation here, I hope, ever. I always tell people my house floods, then we need to be building an ark, because I'm probably one of the highest points in the city. Okay, your change of occupancy, we discussed that pretty well. If you change it, you got requirements, you go through that tables, through those tables in chapter 10, decide whether you're increasing your hazard or not. You increase your hazard, then you're gonna have some things you're gonna have to comply with. So here's an example. Your hazard category classifications, you got R3 down here, <laughs> uh, and then as you go up, Nightclubs and H1 and I are the highest hazards. Excuse me, why do you think they're the highest hazards? Hazardous occupancies are going to have uh, flammable combustible materials in them. Dynamite, gasoline, things like that. Obviously very hazardous. Institutional I is things like um, prisons, uh, nursing homes, they have people that can't e evacuate on their own, can't egress on their own, or uh, are incapable of egressing, or um, are locked in and can't get out type of scenario. So they have, they're the highest category. So if you move to those, you're going to have to meet all the requirements of the current code. Nightclubs are listed with those. Again, because of the nightclub fire that we had uh, upstate, <coughs> the committee decided to put those at the top of the list with those other two. So uh, mostly put it there because nightclubs are generally <laughs> changed from restaurant A2. 
to a nightclub. So I decided to put nightclub above the A2 and that was the only other level. So there it is in the top level. Because they always said, if you're moving from just your regular restaurant to a nightclub, now you're going to meet the requirements for that nightclub because of that increase in hazard. Okay. So, so it goes through all those things, means of egress, uh, accessibility. So you have all those things that come up. Additions, obviously additions going to meet the current code, basically. Uh, it doesn't affect that existing building unless you're egressing from that addition back through the existing building, then that may affect it. Uh, one of the easiest things about additions is if you have a large building and you're going to build a large addition, to make it the most simple, build a firewall. If you build a firewall, a true firewall, and these guys, you guys don't know what I mean when I say firewall. A firewall is a wall that stands in place, separates two buildings, they're butted right up against each other, and that wall will stay in place no matter which building burns and falls on either side of it. All, most of downtown was built that way, type three buildings. They have a two hour exterior wall, they have a party wall in between the two, which is a firewall, it's usually 12 inches of masonry brick. And the joists are all set in that brick so that they're mitered such that if this joist burns and falls, it'll tilt and fall out of that wall without tearing the wall down. Pretty neat, huh? Somebody figured that out long before the codes. <coughs> so if you got that firewall in there, this addition then is a building unto itself. Don't worry much about that existing building. You guys may not have much of that downtown, however. It's just not space for it. Uh, backing up here. Additions, historic buildings. <coughs> historic buildings are tricky. Um, you have different classifications from my understanding of it. You may have a historic district that the building contributes to may not be a historic building. So you get that building classified historic building, you got a lot of things that you're off the hook for. If the local inspection department allows it. It puts a lot of pressure <laughs> on these guys, but they've got to make a determination of whether the building is remaining safe. And that's an awful relative term. What I think safe may not be the same as what you think is safe, what Cliff thinks is safe, or Keith, or Kenny. It's going to be a varying thing. So you're going to, you, it's a tough target to meet. But if you've got that situation and you want to use it, the best thing you can do is talk to the inspection department quickly up front on a project before you get started on it to get a full understanding of what's going to be allowed and what's not. All right? Performance compliance. I love this section. <coughs> And if I could design in the state, I'd love this section even more. Excuse me. Because what this does is it allows you to do trade-offs. you got a building that should normally be sprinklered, and it's not. This thing allows you to go in and say, okay, I'm going to increase the rating requirements on my corridors or increase the number of exits or things like that. You can trade off and do this instead of doing that. You can pick the most cost of, the most cost effective means of renovating that building like that. Okay? You pick the most cost effective thing to increase your safety on to make this thing work out. And this you go through all these uh, I want to say it's probably close to two dozen of these tables you go through and figure out, uh, assess it for safety, and then you get a passing or a fail score based on the inputs you put in it. Now, the th what's really good about this is you can put the inputs in of the building just like it is, and it fails. Now you can go to this table and start adjusting this table to figure out this makes it pass. I'd rather do this than that. So I change this one back and I increase safety on this table and make it pass. All right? So 
you can figure out which way you want to do it. To make it even easier, it's not on our website yet, uh, yet. the last edition, 2015, it's on there, but we haven't put one on for the 18 yet. There's a spreadsheet, uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. You can go into and you can just put your numbers in and it'll automatically figure out pass fail for you. You don't have to do any math, which is my favorite part of it. <coughs> I do not like the math. So <coughs> I'll probably have that on the website in the next week or two for you. Is, is there any subjectivity to that? In other words, could local inspectors say, we don't like your choices even though you've mm -mm. passed? No, no subjectivity. If you pass, you pass. Now, the tricky part is you have to put in the correct input. Sure. It's like anything else. If you put in trash, you're going to get trash back. So whatever input you put in, you need to get that verified with the inspection department make sure that you have accurately done it because when it comes down to it, these guys know more about the codes than in the rest of us. And that's the way it works. My favorite would be that. But like I say, it gives you options. You got those options of different ways to do it. You get to pick. You do it this performance method, you can go back to the work area method, or you can go back to the prescriptive. Whichever way you prefer. A lot of not a lot. Some designers prefer the prescriptive method because they're not familiar enough with the existing building code to really use it. They want to go to the current code, which that's what basically prescriptive does. They're familiar with the with the with the current code, so they just go there. Makes it easier for them. They spend less time on. If it's a small project, might be worthwhile to do it that way. <coughs> Larger projects, it's probably better to go to the, either the work area or the performance method. You got these appendices. You got additional requirements, uh, supplemental provisions for accessibility. You got to got to meet all those uh, all the um, appendices were adopted by the council, so you got to meet all those requirements. All right, and then there's that resource A, the archaic materials and assemblies. Important, that's an important part to an existing building, I think. Doesn't get used nearly enough. A lot of people don't even know what it's there and what it's for. So if you go to this website, uh, the engine, if you go to the DOI website, there's a selection area for divisions. And you can go to the engineering division uh, and click engineering and codes. And that's going to take you to uh, places where you can get things like uh, web interpretations that we write, which are formal interpretations on code. Uh, you can get um, guidance papers on things. That uh, spreadsheet I'm telling you about, this is how you get to that spreadsheet. It's on the web and you can download that Excel spreadsheet. There's other resources there too uh, that can be used by the designers and by you, you owners. So this is an example of one of the web interpretations that was done on existing building code. They're broken down by codes. There's some for existing, all the different codes, the plumbing, mechanical, uh, a few on electrical, and uh, some, a fair amount on building, a lot on residential. Residential code gets a lot of attention. This is a spreadsheet I'm telling you about. This is what it looks like. You just put your inputs in. Uh, number of floors connected to, you know, just, you just put that information in and it's going to give you a number in that box. And this will add up to a pass fail over there on the far right near the bottom is a pass fail. And any notes you want to make about things you assumed or something like that, you can put in that notes box. Turn that into the inspection department when it's complete, and they'll put it in their file. All right, that's me. If you need me, that's my phone number. That's my email address.